Hello everyone, today we talk about 14th century Welsh infantry um, and it, mostly talking about the one serving in English armies but you know also the French made use of them etc so we, they are documented also in Switzerland in, in you know, many places, you know, you know the 14th century uh, sees a big deal of kind of internationalization of warfare, Europe fundamentally solidifies, Western Europe solidifies as uh, an homogeneous reality from from a military standpoint mm, almost completely but in fact it's it's nice to look at these frontier areas well you know in english historic it's called like the celtic fringe right including wales and you know, in part also scotland in in spite of its process of feudalization that by the 14th century was importantly uh, advanced but as you know you know in the west highlands for example things were some world more archaic. The same goes for Ireland and other areas such as Cornwall itself, um, uh, etc. That remained, uh, in fact, more mm, peripheral to these changes and kept producing certain typologies of fighters that uh, were somewhat more traditional in nature and even reminiscent of mm, millennia of uh, old warfare right if you look here uh, the, the typical welsh foot soldiers we we uh, outline it now so stereotypically uh, it's not that different from you know celtic uh, you know some britonic fighters in classical warfare certain aspects remained uh, essentially unchanged right and this is something we tend to forget uh, a little bit because you see as for most times in history we tend to focus on naturally on the evidence that we get and this evidence is more likely to have been the one of the elite right so for us mm, almost stereotypically like in also it, let's be honest it's more interesting right here welsh uh warriors also were you know think about knights the nobility etc they were you know equipped but like i don't know an english knight would be um completely without uh without distinction right uh, the same thing we can find in scotland even in ireland by a certain degree Right. There is a bit this uh, stereotype that uh, almost these areas were also kind of more technologically, but it's not even so far from the truth. But as we know, militarily speaking, what makes a difference is not technology. Um, it's never been historically in any single military context. Right. Uh, the, what makes a difference is properly the, the collective quality of these troops, their moral forces, how they're led, what's their level of experience of training, um, and so on. And um, so it's uh, it's easy to forget often how poor this world concretely was, right? We're talking about the 14th century, even in the richest areas of Europe. If you had taken a, a ride around the countryside, etc., you would have seen misery, right? We know what pre-industrial societies were. They were extremely squalid, right? And kind of morally despicable, right? Yeah. Uh, rape, violence, incest, you know, all the things we can't... We, we, we documented them pretty well, also in more recent times. And sometimes even in the same Europe, by the way. <laughs> from, you know, even just, I don't know, from the modern age, we have enough data to document certain things. Um, and properly the material culture and the, uh, the, the lifestyle of these people was fundamentally rough. Mm -hmm. And in areas such as Wales, and especially the northern part, um, still... Lots of people maintain kind of a clinic, tri tribal society, right? They were that kind of uh, hard-tempered uh, uh, warriors that lived in this fundamentally wild uh, uh, environments and living out of you know their their own individual province and having this this close uh, cohesion with the familiar group and going at war like that and so on. Um, and you know. When Edward I of England began his campaign to crush the Welsh, uh, uh, the, the marches had been more or less under Anglo-Norman domination for some time. So Wales, compared to Ireland and some areas of Scotland, was historically more anglicized, but up to a certain point, right? And uh, the but from from Chester in the north to Netherquent on the Severn estuary in the south, um, the the Welsh could largely be considered you know, English allies. However, as also some authors pointed out, the tribesmen of the mountainous north 
were different from their countrymen in the south and central Wales, right? The, those northern um, areas were not more uh, Normanized than what was, I don't know, the Scottish lowlands or the East Ireland, right? Um, so mm, these troopers that we see here, that the, the English also more, you know, in increasingly incorporated in their armies since the... the, the mm, yeah, it had been historically since the Anglo-Norman invasion, but this intensified with Welsh wars, and also all the the Welsh troops that fundamentally poured into English armies during the Hundred Years' War, and it's fundamentally the ones that we're looking at uh, today, were, mm, were, you know, a treat, right? They, they were this ferocious kind of Celtic spearmen and bowmen that also got a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, a favorable press, historiographically speaking, but uh, they were surely good troops, but also in comparison, for example, to certain, you know, to, to, to English average, etc., there are certain prejudices that should be properly debunked at some point. They're fairly famous, right? Probably one of the greatest myths in absolute terms is that the, um, you know, the, the, the massive use of, of, of longbows in English armies during the 14th century would have been somewhat a, a Welsh influence dynamic. That's completely false by any single historical evidence that we possess, right? Uh, not just because the English had already uh, prized, uh, you know, communities of woodsmen were recorded especially because of their uh, bow capabilities, uh, and of course the longbow existed. Uh, all over Western Europe in the same way since prehistory in every single place, um, and the um, the the English actually paid their own archers more than the Welsh ones, but properly because there is no evidence of the fact that uh, the uh, the Edwardian reforms right uh, fulfilled and you know just completely by Edward the Third principally, but started with. Edward I and Edward II, have probably nothing to do with uh, some kind of reinvention of, of weaponry or introduction from other peoples. No, it was already there, and it was a process that we'll have, we have discussed it here and there. Uh, in some videos we made, I uh, created an um, English warfare playlist in medieval, medieval England as well, aside from the more general uh, medieval Britain and Ireland, that discusses uh, this but we'll have to make a specific video on it to, to explain it also better. Uh, and the fact that there were lots of Welsh archers in uh, 14th century English armies is not because the Welsh were somewhat more or less specialized in uh, bow use compared to the English or any other available uh, troop. But also, the, you know, the Scots had archers. The, uh, you know, there is a as we will see, also the Welsh would go fight with, for the French as well, but properly because of internal dynamics to, of, of Britain that would bring, as it happens basically in any other region in Europe, like you know the, the poorer areas, right, to that had less local resources to support, you know, the demographic growth, etc., to to fundamentally export fighters to go live and die as uh, soldiers in. Uh, for a living, properly, uh, as a job, right? So that's the dynamic. And uh, it's a clever one, because is if, if as we have seen, the, um, you know, the, the, the Welsh archers well, were paid uh, regularly less than the English ones during Edward I's times, and also later on, there is no evidence that there was any difference in that kind. And in fact, in the 14th century, what made actually in the, the success of English armies was not even a particular tactics, right? You know, long bows and men at arms in that specific foot formation, etc., was was a mean to an end. It's the ancient political unity uh, and solidity of the English kingdom and uh, properly a professional uh, employment of, of, of these armies you know, in a repeated fashion overseas, living off the land, and the professionalization of the army in the process and the increase of its collective training and effectiveness that made that system work, right? Which has nothing to do with who used what weapon or anything.
right? Also, let me tell you, the longbow is not as a piece of technology that, as we've seen, in fact, is by itself irrelevant to warfare, but as properly the tactic that, you know, its employment is it, overrated, right? It's overrated um, in comparison of what made the effectiveness of the, that tactic in the first place, right? There is a lot of mechanism and technologism as you understand it, we counter all the time here. But even if you look at the major engagements of the Hundred Years' War, there is no clear um, even proof that the you know the, the longbowmen altogether, considering numbers, m tactical situations, were any particularly superior by themselves to to, to crossbowmen and and when employed, uh, you know, the right way. That there is really no currency is perhaps one of the best examples, and also we cover. I mean partly not the battle but you know the period today the, there is no comparison right i read books called like the triumph of the longbow as a title to to, to the battle of crecy look at what you know the numbers were the, the incredible numerical disparity how for example the genoese were misused of what was the terrain etc all the also the consequences of that that is to say you know the french kept using those mercenaries all, all along right and Meaning that evidently that wasn't kind of the problem. And no, you're not more intelligent than a 14th century French king or, or nobleman or that arranged these armies. Uh, nor am I, right? So we should be very careful, first of all, at, at judging so, um, let's say, uh, apolitically certain, certain realities without properly getting to the point. So w the Welsh foot soldier at this point was essentially a very good, what was the advantage of this is that these men were you know very resilient fighters right they they were tough they live in in in, in an environmental reality that would make them good fighters would make them accustomed to the strains of the weather of of fatigue of of combat itself because you know those 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 were pretty tumultuous areas from from the within aside from you know english expansionism um, and so on, uh, and therefore those universally make, you know, normally the best troops. Like, would you think even historically, uh, most troops came? But they were mostly countryside people, right? They were, you know, accustomed to to the strains of farming, of knowing how to build fences, having a, you know, knowing how to live with sometimes with nothing, literally, also in terms of food, etc. Um, so these non-gentrified areas that for for this exact reason made areas like Wales for, for the English uh, for that matter or others around Europe for, for other powers so suitable for you know as and we'll see what tactical uh, role they they fundamentally covered which was also as you understand not an extraordinary one right these were fundamentally light infantry most of the times but their cohesion also is important in, in assessing their quality uh, speaking of equipment, that is essentially what we will talk about today. Froissart uh, records that at Crecy there were Welshmen and Cornishmen, Galois and Cornouaillat, armed with what the French chronicler calls Grande Cutie, which um, basically is, is this double edged um, kind of, you can say dagger, it's more like something more tending towards a falch, right? This thing is where you used to chop down people to pieces, right? And especially in a largely unarmored reality like the one of Welsh warfare, then in fact produce these soldiers that at the eyes of others said, say, they, these guys, we'll read it, the, the episodes now, they, they go mm, naked, right? They go without armor fundamentally of any kind. Um, and um, and this specific role recorded at the Battle of Crecy, still by Fressa, is uh, in an advanced position between the archers and men-at-arms to kill, fundamentally, the unhorsed French knights without mercy, right? So this is a very interesting uh, role that actually was present in all uh, European warfare. I, it's easy to document, basically, in any other. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen it in, uh, uh, in, in France, the Flemish, in Italy. It, it's 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 pretty universal, right? 
uh, infantry had always served, also since the previous centuries, um, and especially this light infantry, right, is pretty agile, quick one. These were quick runners, and they, they were habituated in tough terrains, etc. To, um, essentially, to, to go, come out of the ranks, mostly made by heavy infantry, that instead was the one that had to stand firm at this point to withstand cavalry charges that he, uh, in the early 14th century fundamentally managed to fence off for, you know, after a couple of centuries for the first time cavalry in uh, all alone right in the in the western europe to come out as light infantry and to finish off uh the french knights and not only right but also to cut properly the uh the horses bellies right and to 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 help in the struggle as you know most horses were unarmored so it was easy for these guys to go when Cavalry halted because of the uh, of the impact. You know, cavalry charges were fundamentally led on three ranks, three four ranks. Um, the the first um, the first one did the charge uh, occurred like uh, up to the last meters, uh, as you know, with an acceleration, etc. Then just the first line would actually impact into the enemy ranks, whereas the others would stop because it's not like infantry that you can't press right with cavalry because at that point you know just you had the, the, the horses club you know banging against one another and you know would mess up the formation it's important for the mass so that you know if the first line broke through uh these guys uh, behind could could spot you know the best way to get in and at that point uh cavalry is vulnerable right there is uh, hardly a, a more dangerous moment for cavalry than the, the one rightly but when the charge is halted right because then as you know, cavalry as an arm, by definition, cannot defend. So even light troopers like these, and we see they had fundamentally spears in this large, uh, this war, fundamentally they would be able to, to to attack them easily, especially to attack the horses, right? And uh, the knights were getting ever heavier. So if you you know they, they, they their horse was killed under them, they, they would fall, and maybe remain stuck with their legs under the, the horse on the side, and they could be finished off by these guys with other some kind of uh, s the daggers, or uh, you know the Scots like you know the double hand axe, you know the Flemish the good and uh, Swiss the Italians other types of axes, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, it was a pretty, as we've seen before, even for this, a pretty universal business. Those were traumatic weapons designed to smash, you know, properly up to, to cause trauma underneath the armor. Here for the Welsh, we think they're not witness, but yeah, they, they could have axes easily or uh, other, you know, clubs, for example, that are still much more, uh, they were actually a much more mm, common weapon probably than we think, especially in these areas such as the, the one of uh, the ones of the Celtic fringe, right? And especially against cavalry, that was uh, important because most of these people's problems were, like for the Irish, etc., is that uh, they wouldn't have much armor nor much cavalry themselves. So th the problem was to knock out the, the top of what you know the the the, the Western civilization had produced in terms of the the heavily armored knight right and it, it was a challenge right and they would find uh, the best ways to, to compensate for, for that asymmetry right uh, and uh, and uh, other sources also speak about the, the battle of uh, Crecy that the Welsh element in uh, in the battle were was from North Wales right and these were armed um, uh, with uh, with lances, swords, or quote lances and other suitable arms, as we're saying here, right? So there is a almost um, you know icon iconic um, representation of such uh, Welsh fighters in the chapter house Liber A, right of 1295, so more or less our time, that represents just such kind of a knife of sword wielding soldier as Froissart describes right uh, and um, this weapon is quite fascinating because it's wild it remembers really those also the Irish had similar thing you know those uh, you know ancient Celtic weapons used in pretty um, pretty ferocious ways Consider that 
much of, of the Welsh custom of weaponry had a strong Celtic influence still today. This is revealed, for example, in the cloak clasps, the same sword as we've seen. Um, and as we were saying, it's meant to chop, right? You stick these things into a horse belly, or you cut, you know, uh, an inservient limb, arm with, with that. You know, it, that that's what they're designed uh, to do. And plus, they have this the spear, right? Um, spears that, as far as I understand, could be pretty, pretty long. Um, and, uh, however, do not seem to have been successfully employed like, I don't know, the, the ones uh, of the Scots in the skill term were, uh, let's say, pikes were, of course, also a universal weapon, but the problem in early 14th century warfare was determining who had enough um, cohesion, right, to, uh, as, a, as infantry, to manage to withstand a cavalry charge successfully. Right, infantry had always withstood cavalry charges in a way or another. Right, more or less, uh, you know, routing. However, m sooner or later, right. And the, the thing was always, you know, let's wait for cavalry to support us in in the meanwhile. Right. At this point, some infantry manages to do that. And as far as I know, the Welsh one uh, didn't produce any of this. Right. Uh, and this is kind of normal, considering also where this happened. I mean, with Scotland, you have. Essentially, at this point, a, a formally feudal kingdom that is a bit less feudal than the others, actually. But you know that frames the levy and into certain you know prolonged um, campaign against the English, etc. It, it has you know a, a hierarchy, a, you know determination, etc. The, the Welsh also, demographically speaking, or they, they wouldn't they wouldn't have the the consistency. Or the the opportunity to prove such uh, you know such capability, right? Uh, it it is true that there were similar uh, realities. I don't know. Think about the Dithmarsh, etc. But that's, for example, also another matter of terrain, or also probably even the chance of, of fighting a large battle, right? Uh, there is not just war to settle problems. There is just politics, economical penetration. I mean, it's. Uh, the way certain peoples lost their independence is uh, w was gradual, right? You know, th at the end of this point, think about Owain. Uh, the Welsh kind of rebelled again, right? Then Henry V simply let them do, right? They didn't even punish them fundamentally because they didn't at that point, you know, what could Wales do against England? I mean, realistically. Mm -hmm. Well, for Scotland, as you understand, it's already different. And uh, it, the, the combinations, the... the, the um, the chemistry that brought all the various factors together to, to make certain infantries managing to win on the field against heavy cavalry is are, are, are very complex, right? So you can't just work mystically say, okay, this infantry could do it, this other could. It depended on, I mean, from from that counter, not it depended on the situation, right? Even the same Flemish after Courtrai, after all, didn't actually achieve much to tell it all, right? The Swiss were favored. By certain, you know, the, the enemy's mistakes or the the ground, etc. Uh, by the the 14th century, the 15th, it's a whole, you know, it's a whole different thing. Um, but just for for saying that, generally speaking, if certain military cultures are lagging behind, it's it properly because there is all a political and social background that doesn't quite confer them much chances to to. Uh, to withstand, uh, you know, bulkier, more, more solid, advanced systems, like especially the English one at this point, proved to be under pretty good monarchs you know, that were pretty invested in this military development for 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 that matter as well. Uh, there are other curious, like there is another source saying that the knife used by the Welsh was hung from the back to the belt not in use, right? And this seemingly contributed to the story that uh, circulated in, in France um, that the English had tails, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, speaking of the spear, as we were saying before, uh, the, the spear had uh, had a kind of... Um, uh, it, it was fun fundamentally rhomboid, but with the upper sides um, curved, convexly towards uh, the, the inside, right, and uh, uh, yeah, with some, some pairing capacities and a kind of a thinning of, of, of the tip uh, at the top, and uh, but there would be other types surely, but we know that this 
one specifically was in use still by the 15th century when John Rose uh, pictured the troops of uh, Glendower. And we don't have to underestimate, however, the quality of such infantry also in, in, in terms of ability of withstanding a uh, cavalry charge, right? Because such long spears, especially, you know, this was typical of commoners in this time, and generally speaking, throughout all, you know, warfare, you know, the least you are armored and the more you won't keep at distance your opponent, right? Only knights that are covered in armor go with uh, with uh, I don't know maces in 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 the fray in the melee right these guys as we've seen would do it maybe just running for a moment out of the uh, out of the ranks between a, an enemy charge and another to finish off uh, a wounded uh, knight right but they they were not of course they wouldn't expose it it's it's your life right um, and such long spears would, at some point could be termed also as pikes. Right then, we will see also in, in the uh, how these troops were integrated in, in the English armies systematically at this point, and there were pikemen, there were people like we, we get the uh, as we'll see now that the longer they stayed in English service the, and the best they were kept. Right, also on the longer run, generally speaking, uh, 14th century warfare is also a moment of acceleration towards the end of the Middle Ages, properly of the level of of, our, of armor on the field, right? So uh, the difference with the, uh, the average within the Celtic fringe that was largely unarmored, except for the, the ultra-elite, well, uh, is, is, is meaningful uh, at that point. Um, so... Regarding also the clothing, and to give also a bit the psychological profile of these troops, there is an account on Welshmen at the time uh, of uh, in Edward I's service in 1297, telling us that, quote, in the very depth of winter, they, the Welshmen, were running about bare-legged. They wore a red robe. They could not have been warm. I never saw them wearing armor. Literally, right? So this is a bit stereotypical, of course, because we know that the Welsh had their own armor, right? Um, their chieftains mostly would wear um, a short-sleeved leather jerkin with applied iron scales. I think that would be typical, right? Scales would be made in kind of a standard pattern and arranged into horizontal rows and soon onto the leather surface, right? Each row overlapping the row beneath by about a quarter at resistance and um, and so you have these guys basically go bare-legged which is something way more common than we think right humans by nature are made to to go bare-legged right uh, if, if you you know <laughs> in spite of the atrocious sufferances uh, the, the the foot gets its colors and you can't literally go uh, on most terrain, right? These guys were uh, fully habituated to that and that means a lot, as we were saying before, in terms properly also of, you know, sending these guys on difficult terrain for a, for a long time uh, in dear straits, let's say, you know, even under the weather or something, right? You know, uh, not, uh, here say they, they could not have been warm, the source says, and of course, yes, this is kind of a physical realization. If you are not covered enough, you go here in winter, even with a red robe, you kind of surely was maxim, uh, maximizing its heating effect for the time, um, uh, cost benefits, affordability. But um, the uh, they they would suffer cold uh, as well, and uh, also the same source goes on saying that their arms comprised bows, arrows, swords and javelins and that their clothes were of linen. Right. What is fascinating by the way from these accounts is that we get especially the, the fighting, uh, um, the combat accounts, is that Welsh warriors mostly carried two spears each right, to throw at the moment of, of the engagement. 
uh, the other to be retained and wielded in, in, in the hand. Uh, so this is kind of the standard, like a, a Celtic warrior of, of, of uh, 1,000 years before would be the same exact thing, right? Um, and the essence of this, that, that would have been literally the, the average of, of the world in ancient times, right? Basically, every single people fought in the same identical way. Right, if they were sedentaries, uh, or let's say they were not uh, horse peoples like the ones with steps, etc. Fundamentally, the warrior was that one. It's it's the best thing you can do about that. You have the spears slash javelins that you can use fundamentally as in both ways. Right, as we often said, you know, the one you would retain more as a stopping spear would be more functionalized in that sense. But javelins also were kind of similar, and. Also, here we could digress in the varieties of these weapons from an archaeological point of view, but aside from the fact that I'm not competent about that, uh, but, you know, it, it's obvious that things change also in terms... You, you may want to throw a large spear sometimes. Well, if you're if you're strong enough, if the situation is, 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 is difficult, or say, even, let's presume you're running away, you have an enemy in the front, you, you throw all the weights and you prefer to throw your massive spear that you use just in hand-to-hand -hand fighting for as a, as a javelin. Well, that is something pretty dangerous <laughs> that is arriving at the other guy in front of you, right? And um, and as we were saying, like, this, you know, let's say even medium-sized contingents provided with enough cohesion of, of, of spearmen of this type could, could be a serious, mm, a serious problem for cavalry in, in itself. Right. And Barbour describing the Welsh infantry at the 1314 Battle of Bannockburn similarly observed that the Welsh were only lightly clothed, stating that they, um, that, uh, that, uh, quote, wherever they get men might them can, for they well near all naked wear, or linen clothes had but mare. Right. So more or less it's the same picture. It would be completely normal. As we were saying before, the regularization of their employment, uh, specifically under also Edward III's times and his astonishing military uh, commitment, somewhat uh, increased their level of, uh, of equipment, right? The ones serving uh, in this period, in fact, were seemingly better dressed Welsh contingents in uniforms are regarded, uh, recorded as early as 1337, which is one of the earliest also, you know, explicit mentions of uniformity in uh, medieval, let's say, military clothing, which also properly didn't exist as military as such, but um, still, we, we made also a video about this uh, recently. Um, and that were also in color, famously green and white, from 1346, right? And we also get uh, the mention by 1355 of some Welsh infantry being even mounted. Uh, this is also important because, of course, Welsh had cavalry as well, but they figure overwhelmingly as infantry. Even in there, as we were saying before, the elites were not uh, so elite like in a feudal country. So cavalry properly was less important in Welsh warfare, also because the, the freemen would be more capable of, let's say, uh, properly retain a greater strength. This is typical of those tribal societies, originally speaking, that the elite was very uh, was prevented for, for a while to, to rise. Right by the same freemen that didn't want it to, to be subjugated. Still, the compared to feudal society's standards was evident for the Welsh, right, say, in comparison to the English. Um, and mounted infantry was quite important during the Hundred Years' War. As you know, especially during the English uh, chevauchée, many longbowmen were mounted. Uh, and uh, we have from the uh, chapter house Liber A uh, also depictions of Welsh uh, archers, and of course not all of them were longbowmen, right? We we don't get that. Remember that uh, 
Geraldus Cambrensis spread this idea that the Welsh had this terrifying bows that could pierce through, you know, with the, their arrows, you know, through the, the armored thigh and the, of the rider and the and the belly of the horse and nailing uh, the, the 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 horsemen, or, you know, like that. You know, and uh, it is true that once the Welsh were brought by the English against the Irish, and they performed very well. Right. Also, there the Irish were largely unarmored, so maybe that's also another thing. But we just you know it might have been a contingental thing. So, as we were saying before, nobody says that the Welsh were bad archers, but uh, there is no proof that they made use of longbow more or less than the, the English or the Scots. Right, literally, um, and uh, and in fact, some of these depictions are of the normal self bow, no, not the large one. It's it's just the longbow would be used by the long people. Right, literally, uh, weapons were built on the on the base of of the person of the yeah of the person's size who had to use them, and therefore usually tall, robust people that normally use this weapon for hunting were chosen uh, doctrinally eventually by the English to have longbow and also to become at this point kind of professional, and and in fact, horse archery was a thing. Two, right? In Western Europe, we generally don't think out oh, horse archery is somewhat some, something more exotic, Eastern sounding. But actually, that always existed, right? Starting from the same nights, actually, that even though they would preferably naturally fight in thickly packed formations for the sake of a shock charge, etc. But they all knew how to use a bow as, you know, uh, on horseback for hunting, or a crossbow for that matter. That nobody absolutely ever cared to not to use independently of what the, uh, the 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 Pope said, which is also something that is often miscontextualized properly in terms of papal policy that didn't specifically mean not to use that weapon uh in a in a absolute sense of immorality. But properly also these guys, right? You know, knowing did Welshmen knew how the average Welshman knew how to ride a horse well, you know, probably it wasn't a, it was not an equestrian culture in, by itself, but you know, more or less, yeah. That they, these people were leaving normally at contact with their, with their animals. They 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 wouldn't be the typical horsemen, let's say, but they surely knew how to ride a uh, one, uh, a horse, and um, and in any case, people would learn because you learn that, right? It's much more difficult to learn how to use a a bow that. Uh, horse riding, let's say, uh, in a in a minimally uh, proficient way, for for an army standard, uh, and horse archers, especially during the Hundred Years' War, are well documented, right? Western Europe, also that the Iberian Peninsula, etc. But the, the French and English armies during the Hundred Years' War displayed this. Um, also, in Central Europe, kind of uh, Germans and Italians had these these things, so it, it's a bit of prejudice. That we have, uh, of course, this had nothing to do with the the typical horse rider of the step you could find in Eastern Europe, but so easily. But still, it was normal to have such uh, horse, uh, mi- let's say, the, this missile cavalry troops, and uh, and of course, the Welsh properly had their own cavalry. I mean, their nobility were horsemen, like any other elite at that time, and. Uh, and they had also their retinues, their middle kind. Yeah, it's just, just that they were, like, numerically, statistically, we don't have the, that quantity, but we can guess it easily in that sense. There were less than there would be in, in, in an English army, comparatively. Um, the Welsh did not fight only for the English at this point. Uh, from the mid-1360s, they were to be found in French employment, too, as we were saying before. We find leaders like uh, military interpreters, right? Like Owen uh, Lovegok, if I pronounce it correctly, quote, of the Red Hand, that is Owen of Wales, last representative of the Royal House of Gwynedd, uh, Yawan Wynn, and Edward Up Owen. Mm-hmm. And um, given other features of their equipment, well, the shield. Usually the shield was oval, with an hemispherical boss covering uh, the recess of the central grip in the case of the best-equipped uh, troopers, right? Otherwise, it would be simpler or 
as we see, not all of these guys would have. Maybe they have smaller bucklers, things like these, to just parry themselves in case of any need of having some minimal protection from, you know, uh, missile falling from from the skies. That even at this point on the major pitch battles were becoming to be really a thing, especially in uh, in Britain, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and this is, yeah. Um, an interesting aspect also to consider but together with the fact that as we've seen the majority of them would be unarmored also to consider that always in the broader logic of an army and of the various uh, elements that make it uh, that is made up of and and their tactical uh, respective tactical function you may want to have literally lighter troops maybe even under enemy fire Right to perform certain tasks and or to adapt to certain situations, uh, because combined arms tactics fundamentally work also in this sense. It's not a matter of what the individual is armored like that makes the best defense. The best defense is made by you know how hard you can hit the enemy, right, uh, and get the upper hand in in that in that sense. So uh, that is also a principle of. Uh, eventually warfare later on when armor becomes uh, sometimes too heavy and they realized that you know simply was more convenient to have for example more offensive power in the same missile than better armor that's a bit the history of uh, renaissance warfare but it's, it's a very different context here we see paradoxically still as we've seen it's as if time had frozen right you could still see a celtic warrior in essence existing on a 14th century battlefield like you could see 1,000 years before, um, and 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 these troops, uh, I presume, in the economy of of, of, a, of a campaign, would be extremely precious, right? They were they were cheap to hire. Uh, they would perform often, you know, risky tasks like any element of the army, but still these were I guess were, were relied mostly on the hit and run tactics and this kind of more also tactical flexibility in a sense on, on, on properly on the field on the on, on, on the terrain but they uh, they surely were this mm, fundamentally reliable light medium infantry that you could deploy also with reasonable mm, also as not really throwaway troops but sacrificeable expandable troops in certain difficult situations that however would hold their ground because they were quite tough minded and and therefore even though not being able to perform dramatically well against you know men at arms etc you know uh, that was not their main role but still they could comfort the action broadly speaking in that combined arm tactic fashion that was the thing by now and uh, and therefore resulting you know, uh, yet one of a uh, 14th century trooper typology that you you wanna bear in mind. But naturally, we will talk about today. As you understand, we talk mostly about their equipment, their will, their, what they looked like, their armament, etc. Then we will make a video on the properly on the Welsh troops, properly from an organizational point of view. Well, how much were they in English armies? How they were uh, levied, etc. And this is for another video we still have to make a lot of them really a lot a lot a lot of them especially the, these last two centuries of the middle ages start to start to be a, really a lot to cover in in uh, in some detail because sources are uh, more and uh, and for that reason also you should make a bit more research uh, for certain topics but we can go at you know deeper detail than than before now right so for now, however, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.